You ask most people to draw a picture of what the inside of the earth looks like, and here's what they'll draw. So first of all, they'll attempt to draw a nice round shape, not as easy as it looks. And then they'll start to label the various layers. You've got the earth's crust, which is about between 5 to 70 kilometers thick. The mantle, which is solid and about 2,850 kilometers thick. The outer core, which is liquid and responsible for our magnetic field, which is about 2,200 kilometers thick. And then the inner core, which is solid and about 1,270 kilometers thick. But hold on, the deepest borehole we've ever drilled is about 12.2 kilometers deep, drilled in the Kola Peninsula in Russia near the Finnish border. It took 29 years. So how do we know what's going on that deep down in the planet that we can draw these diagrams? How can we possibly know that the outer core is liquid? So earthquakes occur when you get a break in the Earth's crust and that releases a shock wave of energy. That's released from the focus. That's where the actual energy is released from. When that energy reaches the surface, it's known as the epicenter. And you get surface waves that can move up and down, or side to side, or a combination of the both, and they can be very destructive. But also leaving the focus deep down in the earthquake, where the earthquake has occurred, are other types of waves called P waves and S waves. Now P for primary, because it's the fastest wave. They travel at about seven kilometers a second. Secondary waves travel at about four kilometers a second. So if you're observing an earthquake in a seismic station at quite a distance, the P waves, which travel faster, are going to arrive first. The S wave, or the secondary waves, are going to arrive second. But P and S waves aren't just different in terms of their speed. They also behave quite differently, which means that when they arrive at seismic stations, we see quite a strange pattern. This strange pattern that we see, if an earthquake was to occur at the North Pole, what we see here in yellow is the distribution of where we detect P and S waves. So we'll detect them in all these different countries that have seismographic stations until we get down to 103 degrees from the North Pole, where the earthquake has occurred. And below that, we don't detect anything. So here in South Africa, nothing at all. Here in South America, nothing at all. Until you get down to 142 degrees from the North Pole. And then, all of a sudden, you start detecting P waves again. But not S waves. We don't see any S waves whatsoever. So, for example, over here in Australia, you wouldn't detect any P or S waves. But here in New Zealand, which is below 142 degrees from the North Pole, you'd start to see P waves again. But you don't see any S waves. Why is this? So these are waves traveling through the body of the Earth, or body waves, or mechanical waves. And there's only two types. There's transverse and longitudinal. So what's the difference between the two? With a longitudinal wave, the particles are moving in the same direction, or the opposite direction, in which the wave is moving, back and forth. With a transverse wave, the particles are moving at 90 degrees, to the direction in which the wave is moving. Here's another view of the longitudinal wave, with a piece of yellow tape showing clearly the motion back and forth in the direction the wave is travelling. And here's the transverse wave with the movement at 90 degrees to the direction in which the wave is moving. If we look at a transverse wave travelling from left to right through a substance at an atomic level, we can see that the atoms are all very organised in a lattice. They do move, but they stay even distances apart because they've got very strong bonds holding them together. You only get these really strong bonds in a solid. You don't get them in a liquid or a gas. For this reason, transverse waves can only travel through solids. They can't travel through a liquid or a gas. Now, just hold on a second. If you Google transverse waves, one of the first examples that you'll see is ripples on a pond. You throw a stone into water, it generates ripples, and they're transverse waves. So why did you, me, just say that transverse waves can't travel through a liquid? 
And this was wrecking my head as well for a while until I found this animation. And this shows the surface of the water if the wind is blowing from left to right or if you throw a pebble into it. Yes, it generates some waves that look like they're transverse on the surface. And these are surface waves. But remember, we're talking about body waves. And you can see yellow particles moving in kind of an elliptical shape. But there is no transverse wave in the body of the water where only compressional waves, like sound waves, can travel. Ask any dolphin. In contrast, compressional waves, there is no strong bond between all the particles. They're free to compress up against each other, moving back and forth as the wave moves back and forth within the substance. You get this sort of situation in a liquid or a gas. But longitudinal waves are just as happy traveling through solids as well. So this means longitudinal waves can travel through solids, liquids or gases. So when we look at P waves and S waves, when they arrive at seismic stations, what we can see is that P waves are longitudinal waves and S waves are transverse waves. So we can tell from what we just learned that P waves can travel through solids and liquids, but S waves can only travel through solids. They can't travel through liquids. So back to our globe. Earlier when we looked at this, we said if there was an earthquake at the North Pole, then we detect P and S waves at all these seismic stations around the world until we got down to 103 degrees from where the earthquake had occurred. For this purpose, we're pretending it's at the North Pole. And then in this gap here, we don't detect any P waves or S waves at all. And then at 142 degrees, we start to detect P waves again but no S waves. The S waves do not get past 103 degrees. There's something inside in the planet that is stopping S waves from traveling below 103 degrees. Now, what do we know that S waves or transverse waves cannot travel through? Liquid. So there must be something liquid in there somewhere. Now the P waves, they've also disappeared and reappeared at 142 degrees. And they've been refracted so much inside in the planet that it can only be explained by an interface between a liquid and a solid. So this one earthquake that's occurred at the North Pole has given us a picture, a tiny, tiny piece of the jigsaw of what the interior of the planet looks like. But there's thousands of earthquakes every single year and seismic stations all over the world are picking them up. They don't just occur like at the North Pole, in our example, it could occur in South America. So if we move, that's where the centre of the earthquake is, and that's the pattern that we'll get. It could occur on the San Andreas Fault in California, which means the centre of the earthquake is here. And that's the pattern that we'll get. Indonesia. So that's the pattern that we'll get. It's very unlikely to happen in Ireland because we're not very close to any active plate boundaries. But if it did, that's the epicentre of the earthquake and that's the pattern that we get. In Japan, the epicentre would be here and that's the pattern that we get. South Africa, the epicentre would be here and that's the pattern that we get. Australia, the epicentre would be here and that's the pattern that we get. In India, the epicentre would be here and that's the pattern that we get. So every time we have an earthquake, no matter how big or small, we're picking up the geometry of the shadow zones and where the P and S waves start arriving and stop arriving and we're learning more about the interior of our planet. And that's how we know that the outer core is liquid. So hopefully that's been entertaining, but more importantly, I hope it's left you with lots of doubts and questions. Is that really what it's like? Is it 103 degrees of the shadow zone or is it 105? Because I've seen different numbers. What other ways could P and S waves be used by engineers in designing things? You said earlier they travelled faster than surface waves. Could they be used to warn us about earthquakes arriving? Hopefully you've got lots of questions and hopefully you'll decide to pursue a career in science, technology or engineering. Try and get some answers.